Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Emilio Del Valle, an admissions counselor here in Stony Brook University's undergraduate admissions office. Uh, the admissions team, as well as our presenters from SBU Libraries, are thrilled to have you all here with us today. Um, our presenters, who will be introducing themselves very shortly, um, have worked very hard to create an uh, interactive yet very informative presentation for you all um, on such a valuable topic that's very important and relevant for our prospective college student population. Okay, some logistics before we get into the presentation. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please be sure uh, to really just drop down those questions and you know you can put those right into the Q&A section towards the end or throughout the presentation as well. Uh, we will have a Q&A session towards the very end of the session. Okay, so please, um, if you do have any questions, or any clarification, please feel free to utilize that Q&A feature, okay? Um, but lastly, before we get started, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenters today. So we have Chris Kretz, the Head of Academic Engagement for SBU Libraries, as well as Christine Fenna, Undergraduate Success Librarian. Furthermore, I will let them take it away and enjoy the presentation, everyone. Thanks, Emilio, and, and thank you all for attending and inviting us into your, your, your virtual rooms. Uh, homes to talk to you about something we're passionate about libraries and research and particularly the two positions christine and i are in we have looked a lot and and talked a lot and helped um, the transition from high school to college so we're, we're very much hoping to give you some advice that will help you uh let you know about the stony brook libraries but also wherever you wind up going we hope you seek out the library because we do believe it is um one of the keys to your your academic career uh, in higher education. Uh, so we are going to talk to you about mastering the art of research, particularly specifically how we do it here at Stony Brook, but again with a lot of tips that hopefully you can take with you. Um, these are some things you might have started to learn or are doing in, at the high school level, but once you get to college, you're going to be sort of in a, in a much wider world of the types of research you'll be doing, the opportunities you'll have, and the challenges that you will face, all good challenges. So just to give you an outline of where we're going, we'll be talking about uh, how you can get to know your library, and we'll go through showing you more about how SBU libraries work to kind of uh, what your appetite we will talk about the wonderful world of databases, which if that's not a familiar uh, topic to you, we'll hope to, to turn you on to some interesting things you'll be able to do. Um, questioning everything, one of the things people think of libraries as a great place to get answers, but it is also a great place to learn how to ask good questions. So we'll talk about how libraries and librarians can help you with that. And then we will be talking about citations, which is a level of uh, the level of research you're going to be entering um, and just walk you through sort of why that's such an important thing, how to cite research, how to do good research and, and uh, start learning good practices. And then we'll, as Emilio said, we will have time to go over any questions that you have. But first, we want to find out a little bit about you. So um, if we're going to launch a poll with some three quick questions for you kind of get a sense of who we're talking to, you know, virtually we're all looking at screens and it's hard to put some things into context. So, and we were talking a little bit, the group before I, I have a son that's a high school senior. He loves when I talk about him, but we're, we're in this process ourselves. So um, I can feel, feel for all of us in terms of trying to find the next step. Okay, so it looks like we do have a good New York contingent from the island and the greater New York state and some great some some out of state interest as well. That's great. And let's see. Yep. And this is always a big question. And again, we always preface this with saying you don't have to know this now. Um, but if you have an interest, at least starting out, it, you know, helps us frame some of the things we'll be showing you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what Stony Brook uh, concentrates on and, and sort of ways that you can develop your interests. And that's the other thing to keep in mind that keep an open mind because you'll be going through a lot of courses over your four plus years, depending on how far you want to go. Um, and plans can change. So keep that in mind. 
Okay, so we've got health sciences. We'll definitely be talking about some health science resources and, and our health science librarians, engineering, social sciences, great. And a lot of these overlap, cross-disciplinariness, if that's a word, that's a, a big um, component of, of where your research can go, where it'll overlap in a lot of different areas. So you may think you're studying one thing and it actually will entail a lot of other things. And this last one, it, you know, we, we hope to let you know some things that libraries do that you may not realize they do, but in terms of social media use, we, we are on a number of channels. We always wanna make sure we're putting our efforts in the right places. And we know Facebook has sort of fallen off a cliff in terms of usage and, and engagement. So uh, seeing so many Instagrammers that kind of tracks with what we are thinking. We are dipping our toes into TikTok. So if you're out there, uh, keep an eye out for our account as we learn how to use it. Okay, so thank you all for participating. Uh, we can end the poll and we'll get back to the presentation. Um, but again, some of that was to just give you a sense of how far uh, you can go in in your academic career. There's a lot of ways to, there, there is no one way anymore to do research or to keep in touch with libraries. So that's um, a theme you'll see running throughout. We're going to also show you some quotes from some of our students or former students. We, we've been doing some um, activities where we get their feedback. And this is Claire. She's actually graduated a biology major. And her first impression of coming to college and seeing the library was intimidation. And, and they, there's a um, phenomenon that, that people actually study called library anxiety. And, and she sort of encapsulates that here, where you come to a new place you see this big infrastructure and, and people already know how to do it and you might feel like um, you should know. And, and we're here to tell you that don't feel anxious. Um, we want to make sure that you take the time to learn your library and know that there are people that can help you navigate it. So at Stony Brook, it's actually officially Stony Brook Libraries with an S, although we, we all, we're all the same people, we're all the same system, but there are multiple locations. Um, we have 10 physical locations spread across three campuses. So where Christine and all of us are today, we're sitting on the West Campus or the main campus. Uh, if you look at the map across Nichols Road uh, to the east is where the hospital is. That's our um, East Campus, our health, health Science Center. And then we have a Southampton Campus, which is about an hour drive east of us, which is a very nice, very small kind of upper, upper level, uh, master's level campuses out there. A lot of health science programs, PT and OT out there. So you might run across that campus in your Stony Brook career. There are 22 what we call li liaison librarians. Uh, Christine and I are two of those, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that connection means. Um, roughly 500 online research databases, and we'll dip into those uh, to show you why those are so important. Over 2 million physical volumes, which actually means items. So it's not just books, although we have a lot of books, but we also have music scores, we have actually vinyl LP collections, we have um, maps, so a lot of different resources that you may be using in your research. So in terms of those 10 locations, those three campuses, there's a lot of little nooks and crannies. So spend time exploring whatever library you wind up at because that's um, will reward yourself with finding the places that you like to study, where you like to study. So these are some of the spaces at Stony Brook, our central reading room, and North Reading Room are on that West Campus. Um, it's called the Melville Library. And Central Reading Room has some nice, you know, we have current magazines and newspapers that you can browse, but there's also seating where you can meet people and a lot of whiteboards that you can create little um, corners where you can do some research and, and practice things uh, with other students. Southampton um, is one big open space basically, but beautiful views and very quiet. The Health Sciences Library, which is interesting if you're studying health science, you'll see some of the doctors and interns come down on their breaks and be doing research in the same space as you. So you get some exposure to what that life is like. And then there are these quiet areas that you can go into. And our music library is another nice little nook where um, they actually have listening stations. You can listen to recordings for classes and things like that. So, so again, a library, it's not one monolithic place. There's a lot of little places that you're gonna be uh, encountering as you go. And I'm just going to give you a quick tour. The, the website is probably the best place. So if you're looking at Stony Brook, hopefully you've seen this already. 
If you're looking at other places, definitely take a look at their library uh, websites. If you're not sure where to go, there's an FAQ section. So we'll just show you that first off, answers a lot of this, the very basic questions. How do you check things out? Where are the books? Things like that. Um, the other thing, I'll note a few special services that we have. We are lending laptops. So especially with the pandemic situation, a lot of uh, students were able to check out a laptop before they left or come in and get one if you don't have one at home or as, as a backup in case you need it. So we are loaning out laptops. Uh, and then we have nooks and crannies within the nooks and crannies. So we have very special specialized study rooms that you can reserve for smaller groups. So that's like groups of two to five. Let me just see if that's gonna open up. And those are in those other areas where you can uh, meet up and reserve them online. So it's just not portraying right now. And I just wanna do a shout out to our special collections. So if you're doing any research, actually a lot of classes will make use of this. These are archival materials, historical materials. So even if you're not doing a history class, it may be a medicine, a history of medicine, you may come in and use it. Um, we have collections related to politics and science. So um, you get exposed to a lot of in-depth research. And one of my favorites, and I'll just show you this quickly, if you know any of your Long Island history, you know that George Washington had a spy ring operating out of actually our area, North Shore, Setauket. And we actually have some of the letters that he was writing to his uh, spy masters on the island. So there is a lot of material in the library. And there's also, I'll show you just quickly, events that we do in terms of helping you learn all the things you'll need to learn. Uh, this will be populating as our, our next, uh, as we go into this new semester. But we do a lot of workshops. A lot of them are still online, teaching you how to do research and the citation guide. So keep an eye out for that wherever you go. Now, I just need to get back to my presentation. Another of our students, Nava Berger, political science and history major, her aha moment, which will bring us to our next section, is she her eyes were opened about research when she learned about and started using the library databases. And again, you may have been or are using some in your high school classes. Your high school library probably has access, your public library. Um, this is the analogy I like to use. So th th think of all the streaming services that are out there now. These are companies that charge you money to get premium content that you can't find anywhere else. So the movies on HBO Max, you're not going to find them on Google streaming for free. So think of the databases as these types of um, specialized access only systems, but for academic content. So the the research that you're going to need to find, they're not published for free, mostly on Google. You need access to these and they don't sell single subscriptions, so that's where the library comes into play. We have paid for subscriptions to these big packages from A to Z, from ABLE, which is an English language and literature database, to zoological information, uh, 472 at the moment. And as, once you're a student here, your ID is your password to get into all of this content. It, it may not ex find, sound exciting now, but once you get into your classes, you find your passion, your major, uh, all of this will start to uh, seem like the really valuable asset that it is because you're gonna be using, you're gonna be asked to find resources that are, are beyond just what you can get through a Google search. So I just wanted to give you a, sort of a, a quick preview of some of the things you can do with these databases. And again, these are things you're not gonna find access to unless you're in an institution like Stony Brook. This is a database called Business Insights, and this is a looking at um, 10 years of revenue of three different, uh, or actually four different um, shoe companies, Nike, Reebok, Adidas, and New Balance. So you can sort of trend if you're doing any marketing uh, work uh, as your major. This is the New York Times from 1918. This is an ad from Macy's during the Spanish flu, and this is an advertisement for window ventilators. They thought if you had these special screens on your windows, it would help keep the flu out. And, and the power of these databases, you can do a search and say, just limit it to the ad. So you can do these huge searches of a whole year's worth of content and say, just show me the ads, show me the obituaries, um, things like that. So there's a lot of power in once you start learning to use these uh, systems. 
if you're doing anything with music or if you're um, taking a film class, we have some great film miners here. Uh, we have a streaming database of music and you could look up um, the screen, the uh, original music to Jaws. I'm not sure if this will play, so let me just give it a shot. And this might not be worth the effort, but again, there's a lot of material in here, the original recordings of symphonies and orchestras and jazz ensembles, things like that. So multimedia content is out there as well. You could also do searches. We have a lot of legal databases. So this is a search for Supreme Court cases involving Major League Baseball. So again, you never know where your research might take you. So this is um, a lot of power that you can do a lot of detailed searching on to find um, case law, state, federal level, things like that. With the health sciences, we have a lot of specialized databases that, uh, again, our, our medical students use. So these are, you know, people in residencies and, and specializing. They use it. This is an animation of um, a certain type of surgery. I try not to look, to look at the medical stuff too much, but over the last year and a half, there was a lot of um, anatomy classes that moved online, and we have anatomy apps so people could um, study anatomy virtually uh, in the moment. You know, it was it was not a substitute for the real thing. But again, a lot of the technology, uh, you can start doing uh, work right away. And in terms of, of asking better questions, you might have a class where you're talking about maybe the, the Disney princess in culture might come up. And as you get into searching databases, it is sort of speaking a different language. So you would start thinking about how do I make that into a search? So you would start learning to think in terms of how the database works and breaking your searches down. This is, looks like a math equation, but it's a way of finding research into how the Disney princess image can affect different people, in this case, girls and uh, children and girls. So uh, if you're doing, you know, developing your research, we would help you develop and how you get from an idea like Disney princess to a final finding someone's research about uh, girls and identity in Disney princess play. So you're gonna be learning a lot of specialized vocabulary and language as you start getting into um, the fields that you're most interested in. This is Melanie, our last student quote. And I, I like this one because her takeaway from uh, her research at Stony Brook is not to just take the first thing. You know, it's not um, you do a Google search and the first one is what you put in your paper. You really start thinking deeper about what it is you wanna find. You don't just take the first thing, you uh, verify your sources and look for what fits what you're trying to find, what you're trying to argue. And the final point that I'm gonna make dovetailing off of Melanie's is that librarians are a good resource for helping you find the best source or develop your topic. So th these are your friendly neighborhood librarians here at Stony Brook, or some of us at least. Uh, we work with individual departments. We also work with different levels of the community. So you'll meet a lot of us in your classes and things like that. We survived the pandemic much as you did, trying to, to keep sane on Zoom and, and meeting in groups and, and socializing and working with students online. Uh, but we do a lot of things to help you. So again, with that anxiety that you might feel starting at a new uh, institution, we have guides online with friendly faces and ways to get in touch with us. We have a chat function uh, that pops up on our website. You can get in touch with us automatically. We do in-person classes. So you'll see different librarians, depending on what you're studying, will come in and develop relationships with you. And it's, it's all to help you start thinking like a researcher. And so we provide the platform, but we also help you use it. And I'm gonna pass this over to Christine because a lot of what the next steps would be in finding your research is um, citing your research. So Christine, if you wanna jump in. Hi everyone, good afternoon, I'm Christine. I hope you're all staying cool today. Any questions so far? Um, based on what Chris has talked about so far. I just thought I'd pause for a second. I don't see anything in the Q&A, but I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, so I'm gonna move on. Um, a lot of times students, now I, I'm not sure if the majority of you are students or parents. <laughs> I'm gonna talk to you uh, like I have at least some students here. 
Um, so I think a lot of times students come in uh, with certain preconceptions about what citation is and what they're gonna be expected to do when they get to college. And I just thought I'd ask all of you, if you wouldn't mind opening up your chat. Uh, Chris, could you go on to the next slide? I just wanted to get your perspectives um, and you know, students or parents, but I'm talking primarily to the students. Why do you think you cite your sources? What have you been told by your teachers? What are your own thoughts? Um, why is it important? Why do teachers always tell you to cite your sources? I'm going to just look at the chat. <laughs> and I'm going to stare at it until we get some responses here. And we just lost the buddy. <laughs> yeah, no, no wrong answers. <laughs> There's no um, wrong answers. Yeah, so students, uh, the, the attendees actually don't have access to the, the chat feature. Oh, they feature. don't have access yeah, to Yeah, but chat. it's okay. So, so for anyone who wants to, to answer this question, please direct that right into the Q&A section. Okay. Um, as soon as you pull it there, we all should have access to see them. Okay, and you can answer uh, anonymously as well if you would like. Great. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Guy. I think this is something that we often focus on, that we cite to give credit, right? To give credit where credit is due, absolutely. Um, to And also to avoid committing plagiarism. Um, here's another one. If there's doubt, um, you provide some evidence. Right, if there's doubt about the source, uh, absolutely, there's a way to go back and maybe check the evidence yourself. Um, so when people read your work, they know the information is reliable. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, it, it gives them a way to actually go and see for themselves, right? If they're not just going to take your word for it that what you're saying is true. That source list is really valuable. Um, what We should cite our sources. This is so Mia, we should cite our sources to not only give credit to, to make sure we use sites that are accurate and reliable. Great, yeah, so uh, you guys have, uh, Chris, can you go on to the next slide? I'm just gonna take you through a couple slides. Most of these you've already said. Um, this is the credit piece, right? That everyone often thinks about giving credit where credit is due. Chris, go on to the next one. And this is that piece that many of you are talking about in terms of showing your credibility, right? It's a way to showcase that you've done your work. You've thought about it. You, you didn't just sort of, like Chris was saying, take the first, the first thing that came up in your Google search. <laughs> but you've actually gone through and gone to maybe a couple of different databases, gone through a couple of different websites and found a variety of sources. And it helps make you, the author, more credible. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and this is what I think someone else was also alluding to this. Um, this is one we don't think about as much. Um, I think when we think of citations, we think of giving credit and avoiding plagiarism. Um, but, but it's really a very powerful, powerful tool when you're doing research to be able to look at the reference list. Um, it helps you not only find more research, but it also helps you go and see for yourself. Uh, if, if you don't wanna take the author's word for it, you can go find that source yourself and read it and see if you are interpreting it the same way that the author did. Next slide. Yep, this is a big one. <laughs> when you uh, get to the university, uh, plagiarism is a very serious, offense and there's some very harsh penalties and you want to make sure you have a very thorough understanding of what it is and your librarians can really help you with that and citation is a really big part of um, avoiding academic dishonesty. Next slide. And this is my favorite. <laughs> this is my favorite thing. This is how I want you to think about your source list. It's really an opportunity for you to show off. You've done so much work. It's so much work doing research. And really when you hit that groove or you find something you're really interested in, it's a really rewarding, exciting, memorable. It, it helps to ground you in a topic and it really um, changes the way you think about something and it's hard work and it's, it's just a great way to show off and feel a sense of pride in what you've found. 
Um, so next slide. Yeah, so this is just to say, I think going in, we often think of citation. It's, you know, it is about giving credit, absolutely. And it is about avoiding plagiarism. Those tend to be the two most foremost thoughts in everyone's mind. But it's also about going to the next slide, Chris. Um, those questions of, of uh, your own authority and showing that you've really done the deep thinking, giving your readers an opportunity to replicate the research you've done and pride in what you've done. And just to add to that, Chris, the next slide. I think that it can very much be about power. And when you think about your, if, if, if everyone, all of us on this, on this Zoom webinar were to research the exact same topic, and we would all come up with a different source list. There would be different sources that would resonate with us, different sources that maybe gave us goosebumps or got us excited, different angles, different scholarly perspectives, different disciplines. Uh, maybe if we were all researching the sinking of the Titanic, some people would focus on oceanography and mapping, and some people would focus on uh, treasure, robbing treasure. <laughs> Some people might focus on the historical elements or journalism uh, when, you know, that uh, the wireless telegraph did its magic and you have uh, that news story on uh, the New York newspapers the next day when the Titanic sank so many different angles. And so your source list is really an expression of your own agency, your own uniqueness, your own individuality. And so it really empowers you as a person and your own unique interaction with the topic that you're researching. It's empowering uh, the authors. You chose very specific people to cite and to quote. And maybe you worked hard to include diverse perspectives, people uh, from different backgrounds, people from different places, from different income brackets, from different communities. And, and, and so you're, you're empowering all the different voices. So, so that's another piece of the empowerment. And finally, you're really empowering your reader. You're giving them the opportunity to go look it up for themselves. So it's just a beautiful thing. And I just, I like students when they're starting college and you're thinking about starting college and you're gonna be doing this research. I know the citation, <laughs> citation feels so tedious. It's everyone's least favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> There's all these silly rules about where the commas go and where the periods go. Um, but if you can just try to tweak your perspective on it a little bit, as important as following those rules are, because that's sort of a way of, of, of speaking the citation language so everyone's on the same page. It's also important to really engage with it and think of it as this exercise in uh, power and empowerment. Um, so those are my thoughts about citation. How are we, Chris? What's next? Yes, uh, and when, when you're doing research, you'll find, um, when you're looking for those citations and formatting those citations, librarians, we are all here to help you. Uh, wherever you end up going, you should definitely reach out to your librarians. They're there to help you. Um, there's these tools uh, that you can use, um, a number of tools you can use. On this slide, it's talking about when, when you're searching, there's gonna be times when you can grab a citation from the database, it'll actually format it for you. But those are done by algorithms, they're not always correct. And so you'll always wanna double check and make sure and ask a librarian um, if you need help. And, and one thing I'll, I'll bring back in, we actually had a, a presentation yesterday in the library, we were talking with um, our vice president for curriculum, but we were talking about a lot of the, the research opportunities that they're building or already have built into the curriculum. So again at stony brook and elsewhere wherever you go look for this the special symposiums or they, they'll have special events where you can present your research as an undergraduate um, so we would help you do the research but then always look for ways that you can demonstrate to other people what you've you've done and and you know that's something stony brook is very um involved in promoting and getting students involved working with faculty in different disciplines through your major through your general education requirements so um, it, it's underlying this all, I think, is a sense of we want to excite you about research and not think about, you know, what what classes do I have to take from this column and this column and check off the list of, of requirements. It's more getting excited about a topic and finding your way into it and then, you know, look and then it doesn't become work. It becomes something as you can, I think you get from Christine and hopefully the way we talk about it, uh, it, it should be something that drives you and you're curious about. Um, 
and that way the library becomes a playground uh, and not just uh, you know someplace you might dread going or or something like that. Seen anything to add to that? We're at the end. We'll leave up our emails. We'll get to questions as well. Uh, but if you are thinking of coming to Stony Brook, you have a leg up because now you know two librarians and, and you can contact us. Like I said, we've done classes with high school students. So we've, we've actually met a few already and, and can help them with research. That chat box I showed you is anonymous. So I, I know we've helped people from outside the university. We, we like questions no matter where they come from. Um, so that's another thing to, to be aware of. Librarians like to help. Don't think you're disturbing them if you come up with a question. It's sort of... Uh, that's what we live for. Um, I do have some uh, questions that were chatted to me privately, if you sure. would like me to share. Okay, great. So it looks like the first question I received is from the overall incoming first year class. Uh, how many of these students typically get involved with research? Um, and the student also followed up with that saying, is this an in-depth level of research um, or are students introduced to research gradually? Christine, you want to take that because you work closely with the yeah. 102s? Sure. Now, I'm going to talk particularly about Stony Brook because that's where I am. Um, you know, every institution is different. Uh, there's all kinds of different colleges and universities out there, and they're all going to have programs that's specific to their campuses. Here, all first year students are going to take a writing course where every single student will complete a research paper. And that is, you know, that, that might be considered more on the introductory level. You're gonna be working with your writing teacher. Uh, you might, um, your teacher might have a librarian come and work with you and show you how to use the library databases. Uh, and so this, th those papers typically, we're talking, you know, eight to 10 pages, maybe sometimes a little bit shorter than that uh, first year, college level research paper. And this is where you really get an opportunity to try some of these research techniques that Chris was showing you with those search strategies, trying different databases, different academic databases, trying all kinds of different sources that you might not have read or watched or used before in a research paper. Uh, not only scholarly articles, but maybe you find some podcast interviews of an author or you're going to mix and match. Uh, maybe you're going into some statistics, a statistical database that you didn't know existed, or maybe you find a cool archive online somewhere. So you're going to really get to dive deep into some sources, newspaper articles, uh, and um, synthesize the ideas you find into a coherent argument, a coherent point. So that is what everyone gets to do in their introductory um, writing classes. Beyond that, there are other opportunities. There is an undergraduate research program here at Stony Brook. It's called Eureka. And there uh, you work typically, it might be a project you started in a class and then you work with a professor as an advisor to help you refine your research project and you get to present it. Uh, like a, a, usually it's a, a poster presentation of the research that you did. Uh, some students participate in that. There is a relatively new program here. It is the vertical, what is the full title of that? Uh, it's VIP, vertical, vertically integrated projects, I want to say. Yes, vertically. Uh, and th these are opportunities uh, where there's a topic. Um, what's an example of one that they have up right now? I don't know if you can share the screen, Chris, but but it's it's an opportunity to work with uh, an interdisciplinary team, uh, and not only it's just a disciplinary in subject matter, but also in uh, very you might have a, a professor, a faculty member, you might have a graduate student, you might have undergraduate students working together on a topic, but from different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and they're trying to bring more undergraduates into those projects to get more undergraduates research opportunities as well. Um, and then of course, depending on your major and depending on the upper division courses that you take, you'll have different types of research opportunities um, depending on whether you're taking history classes or psychology classes or biology classes or chemistry classes, uh, you might have opportunities to work with faculty um, on projects in those different areas. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, that definitely answers that question. And, and just hearing about what you mentioned about, you know, how undergraduate students are taking part in research and what their introductory level courses look like. Um, and there was another question about a student who's more so interested in um, film and I guess uh, concentrations within the arts, but they're worried that they won't be able to take part into research. Um, and I know you mentioned a little bit about depending on your academic program, research might look different. Can you speak a little bit more about that? About film? Yeah, so like, for yeah, I can, I can yeah, say Chris, a few. Chris yeah, is a good person for that. Because um, I work Great. with the the MFA program, which is actually out at Southampton, but they they teach the film minor, uh, which is growing by leaps and bounds. And yeah, so there there are some tracks where you would do research into a topic, but a lot of it is is practical. So it'd be creating films, uh, working on scripts, um, and and developing you know scenes and things like that so they're, they're very practically based they, you get a great grounding in in the history and we have some great uh, collections that you, we have a script database you know you can find the sc shooting scripts for a lot of films in there and, and actually see the original you know um breakdown of how they shot it but but a lot of the the work is um based in practice so you, you do a lot of there's one class i think is just on filming creating a movie with your iphone and so you get a lot of hands-on experience working with great faculty members on, on doing that kind of that kind of work too. Perfect. And I see that Christine has just dropped a link in the chat to everyone. So anyone wondering about um, you know, the programs that we talked about in regards to getting involved with research, you can definitely click, click on that link and access that there. I will move on to another question. This is a more generic question, but what I have here is, are, are librarians going to continue to be accessible virtually as well as in person as we move into this upcoming year? Sure. I mean, one, one thing, um, we, we are teaching in person too. So that, that is just to allay any fears that we're not doing that. But as I, I was mentioning a little bit, you know, over the past year, we, we've been developing our online presence. We've always been online, but with Zoom, uh, we, we've done a lot of outreach. So yes, we're available online. We do one-on-one -on -one consultations through Zoom with students to help um, that chat function, which actually I'm on the page. I'll just open it up. The chat is great because we can actually in real time send you links to databases. So you can say, I'm searching this and we can say, have you searched this and send the link back and forth to the to the database. So yes, we're, we're very much still available online. And, and, and in some ways you can do a lot more uh, in-depth interactions online and on some things in terms of sharing um, links to databases and resources. Perfect. Um, and it looks like I, I just I got a question in regards to plagiarism. So this states, what are the consequences and processes and result of a student plagiarizing? The student followed up and stated um, they're nervous about plagiarism in regards to them accidentally citing something incorrectly. Yeah, this is something that we can both answer this. We're, we're revamping our, our guide for this because it, it, in some way we feel it shouldn't be such a, a stick to hit people with uh, because it, it is a fear. And I know just from speaking from students that, you know, they, they, they're, they're afraid of stepping the wrong way or something. So um, there is a process. I mean, there there is a academic integrity office and and a um, judiciary sort of if, if you find yourself in that position um we're hoping that you don't get to that position where you know you would have to be face um that any kind of um consequences in in the class so we we try to help you in the research process taking good notes making sure you understand the difference between paraphrasing and and direct citation there is a writing center as well to help you with that uh, christine do you want to add anything to the in terms of allaying any fears or or guiding them just say that no, none, not a single one of your professors is going to want you to get caught in that. Uh, they are rooting for you every step of the way. And if you have any questions, uh, you should go, you know, your professors will be happy to answer your questions. If for some reason um, you're still confused after talking to your professor, or you have some concerns, the librarians are here. You can talk to your professor, you can talk to librarians, you can talk to, to everyone, all of us. <laughs> Nobody is going to expect or um, <clears throat> want you to be in that in that position. Everyone's going to give you the resources that you need, or the, do their best to give you the resources that you need, and uh, be there to help you. And so you you should really feel good about asking lots of questions, and expect that everyone's going to expect you to ask questions. I think that's that's the most important piece. Do not come in thinking. <laughs> 
<laughs> that everyone expects you to already know this. If you do get that sense, um, just come talk to us because we'll, we'll reassure you that that it's it's a very confusing topic. We don't expect you to be experts in it. We don't expect you to fully understand it. Even um, full blown professors, scholars, we all have questions about it. It's it's not something that's set in stone. It's it's a very tricky topic, especially with the participatory web environment. There's really lots of interesting, valid questions. Um, so and, and a, a lot and a lot of times you'll be going through drafts. So with the, with the, yes. in the class you'll be handing in a preliminary draft. They'll work with you, especially in the first year. Um, so you'll you'll get a sense of developing a topic. It's not just handing the paper. That's the last. You know, and you get one shot. So you you'll be working with the and and just to um, emphasize what Christine said. Always ask questions. You, you know, don't don't be thinking. Oh, I you know. There, we say there's no stupid questions, and it and it's, we mean it. And it's it's sort of um, you you don't want to you you think of it as getting your money's worth. You know, you you want to get if you don't understand the assignment, ask them to explain it maybe a different way. Or or if if it's not clear on the syllabus, ask them to maybe uh, go over it again because um, you know you're here to learn and not just jump through hoops for someone else. Perfect. And I have two more questions here. It looks like one is a very generic one as well. So and then we have another one in regards to uh, the resources to, to do actual research. Mm -hmm. um, but this first one here is our library. Uh, no, nope, I stated that one already. Um, OK, are there certain libraries that should be utilized based off of a student's academic program? Yes. Well, so libraries and also collections. So, you know, I mentioned we have 10 locations. Uh, that Southampton location has a lot of health science programs, but it also has an, an in-depth um, film research library, which I should have mentioned before. So we have a film professor from NYU that donated a lot of their materials. So that's out there. So yes, I mean, you you would, once you know what you're searching for, the, the material that you may use could be anywhere in the library. So it, it's not like saying, just go to this section for this. It's going to cross over maybe into music. Uh, the business section could be in a couple of different places. So, you know, social issues could be in, in historical sections as opposed to sociology or, or psychology. So, um, you know, you, your, your topic in a sense will dictate where you go to look for it, uh, but we would help you navigate it because it doesn't always make sense how you get around the library. Um, just as background, this, this school was, was built in the early 60s and the original library is basically, they built the new library around it. So it's not always clear how to get from one section to another because it's an interesting architectural feat. They built a building around another building. But um, so that, that's why we're always here to help you interpret you know, what you're looking at on the page is our catalog. So if you're to look something up, it would give you a lot of locations and where we would uh, help direct you where to go to find them. If that makes sense, that's got a little rambling there. Great. Yeah, and, and I, I think, just, I, sorry, I was just going to add that, but anyone is allowed to use any, any yeah, library. So there's, point. there's no, there's, there's no library, one library that you're supposed to use. Um, you can go to any library you want. You can go to the a tiny little nook and cranny in, uh, in the music library. It, even if you're not a music major, you could, you could find a place or sources uh, that you're interested in no matter what. Great, and I think the, the screen here is a perfect segue to this final question that I have here, but it looks like someone would like to know, um, are we provided with free services in regards to accessing different sources for our research assignments and are they easily accessible? I guess what you could just read the first part again in, ten, in terms of what you're yeah, meaning. Yeah, so it, it looks like the student is just wondering, I guess, in regards to finding different sources and, and things to aid them with their research. Um, are there free services for these students? And then the follow up part is, are they easily accessible? Yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking sort of access issues, there there is an office on campus in a, in a room in the library where they can. Um, if, if they need that type of help in terms of, um, you know, special needs or, or access to things like that. Um, in, in terms of subject specific research, you know, that's a little bit of a different question. So it might not be what you're asking, but, um, you know, there, there are subject specific databases and, and resources that you'd be able to access. So again, biology, medical science, as opposed to in-depth business or legal resources. 
Yeah, I think this student is just referring to the databases and I guess okay. how to utilize yeah. them and how to access those services. Yeah, so, and I'll just recap quickly. I'm on the database list. This is that A to Z list of 472 database packages. And we all, we again, we subscribe to these. So as a student, you would have access to all of these. And it's just a list of names until you learn a little bit more. You can read about them, but we break them down by subjects too. So you could look at the ones that are good for biology. So yeah, and all of these are accessible to a Stony Brook student, no matter what level they're at. So it's just, again, off campus, your your ID card is what you log in with. Um, and you can download the, the full text of things if it's available. You can watch streaming movies, listen to that music if you want to. Um, so again, there's, there's a whole host of things you could use and your challenge is figuring out what it is that interests you and, and start looking and start looking for things that. Perfect. Well, that, unless any questions pop up now, that was all the questions that I received privately. Okay. So we are getting close to the conclusion of our event. So if there's any last final words, either Chris or Christine. Christine, I'll let you sum up. Do you have any, what would you be your takeaways for them? Just, you know, when you, the university library is your place to not, uh, not have to look up what anyone else is interested in. It's, it's for you. Um, and you're going to be taking lots of classes. And you're going to feel like you're, maybe you're trying to please your professors, but in the, once you're in the library, you know, you really want to discover what, you, what interests you, what gets you going, what gets you excited. It should be a time of, um, you know, you should occasionally get some goosebumps when you're <laughs> when you're in the library. Um, treasure it, take advantage of it. It's a really special time. It's a tremendous privilege to have access to the kinds of information that you have access to when you have a university affiliation, especially at a research university like Stony Brook. So, so don't let that pass you by. Really uh, take advantage of it. If you're not sure how to, that's what the librarians are here for. And like Chris said, we became librarians because we like answering questions. <laughs> so you're never bothering us. Perfect. Chris, do you have any takeaways before? Yeah, we no, it? again, thank you all for coming. You know, in a way, you in your college search, you're doing research. Obviously, it's not new to you, but you, you know, learning about a college is research itself. So again, these are skills that you've been developing. And then just as you get into the university level, we, we build on that with you. So, um, you know, good luck with everything. And again, thank you for listening to us today. Perfect. Thank you so much for attending, everyone. Uh, there was a ton of resources in the chat that we recommend you all utilize and access at a later time. Um, we also will have our recording of this event on our um, Stony Brook University Admissions YouTube webpage. That link is also in the chat for you to access at a later time. And then, of course, we did have the SBU Library's contact information pulled up. Um, so if you ever want to get in touch with them or also get in touch with us here at Undergraduate Admissions, we will be more than pleased and, and welcome any of your questions. All right, so thank you so much for attending. Stay safe, stay well, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Have a good night. Take care.